Uh, good afternoon, dear panelists, and thank you for being here uh, with us at the Herzliya Conference for this important uh, discussion. We have a great uh, challenge uh, to cover a broad and critical topic in a very short time, so let's try and uh, meet our goal. Um, I will ask you first, Eric. It is argued that uh, the main reasons for the uh, crisis in uh, global democratic order is geopolitical competition, and more specifically, the uh, Ukraine, uh, the Russian in war in Ukraine, and the U.S.-China rivalry. What do you think about this argument? Uh, thank you, Donna. I want to start by uh, thanking you and my and my good friend Amos Gilad for inviting me to uh, to speak here. Uh, today at this conference, and it's an honor to speak with uh, my distinguished colleagues uh, on the panel. So the question we're talking about today is, is the new world order, and, uh, and I think it takes uh, us back to thinking about what the world order uh, was like. We, we all remember the end of the, the Cold War, and post-Soviet world, where the United States was the superpower militarily economically, and in perception. I want to make sure that uh, I stayed here today as the uh, American on the panel, that, uh, well, there are changes, and that there are other poles uh, to look at. You mentioned, uh, obviously, China, and uh, we'll discuss Russia as well. But I'm not sure that much has changed in the high level that we discussed about that same era. The United States still maintains the strongest and most effective military in the world. The United States economy is still the strongest in the world. And while there are challenges and competition between us and China, and while clearly uh, we've seen what's taken place with the Russian military uh, and the uh, inexplainable uh, decisions made by Vladimir Putin, I don't think that the world order has changed as much as those that perceive or like to write about it. I'll give you just a couple examples. First, the question that goes around this entire conference and any conference that I go to around the world, what will happen in the Russia-Ukraine war? I heard Amos Gilad give an excellent brief earlier uh, where he believes that the fight will continue on and it's going to get bloodier. Uh, sadly, I agree with that assessment. I also think that there is a key in 2024, in the next 18 months, as to how the Russia-Ukraine war will continue. And well, I don't want to be too accused of being America-centric. The elections in the United States in 2024 will, in my opinion, decide the ultimate outcome and end and conclusion of the war in Russia and Ukraine. We have heard in my opinion, unfortunately, the two leading potential Republican candidates for presidents in the United States, former President Donald Trump and the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, both go on record saying that they would end the support of the United States to the people of Ukraine, to the military of Ukraine, and to the war effort of President Zelensky in Ukraine. And I want to say that if that should happen, then unfortunately we would see uh, the ultimate demise of Ukraine uh, and President Zelensky, and, and I believe that would be a big problem. I don't want to take too much time of my colleagues, but let me, let me just make one more point about China. So many have looked at what China is trying to do in Africa and in the Middle East. Perhaps you'll ask a question about this, but let me just give one, one brief point. I've been asked 30 plus times about the agreement just being here a day and a half between the Iranians and the Saudis. Brokered, at least allegedly brokered, by the Chinese. What does that mean for US leadership in the United States role in the Middle East? And here's what I will tell you. The United States remains the only guarantor of peace agreements here in the Middle East and around the world. And I pose this simple question to you. 
I believe it was driven by Saudi desire to end the attacks of the Houthis that are supported by Iran. I also believe that should there be one violation of the agreement between the Saudis and the Iranians, it doesn't matter which country goes to China first to ask for enforcement of that agreement, it will be met with deaf ears. After the United States work on the U.S.-Egypt deal in Camp David, there were many details that the United States came to work with the Israelis and the Egyptians on. Should the Saudis come to the Chinese and say, look what the Iranians are doing, I need you to help fix this, the Chinese will not do so. Should the Iranians come to the Chinese and say, this is what the Saudis are doing, I need you to fix this, the Chinese will not do so. I give you that as an example for the world order as it is today. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll pick it up uh, after we'll finish our rounds. And uh, uh, I just wanted to ask you, Professor Mogadam, do you, uh, Asaf, I uh, promised you to, <laughs> um, do you agree with the perception that uh, we are facing the end of post-Cold War uh, global order as we know it, which kept us, you know, historically in a peaceful, orderly um, situation? So I, I definitely think that the, the liberal democratic order is struggling. I don't think, I think that it might be down, but it's not out. Um, I definitely think that there are a number of indications um, why we are witnessing uh, serious challenges to the liberal democratic order. Um, I think, of course, one indication, I think maybe the most obvious indication is um, democratic backsliding, which we've been seeing especially... Democratic, uh, uh, democratic backsliding, I think, is, is the first important uh, indication, which, of course, we've seen in the last uh, decade plus uh, in a variety of countries and increasingly also uh, in the heart of uh, Europe. Um, we've seen this in the United States. And I think that uh, we've seen some uh, unsettling signs also in Israel. Um, you know, uh, some could argue that um, the government might be uh, you know, using a very similar playbook um, than uh, countries like Hungary and uh, Poland. I think another uh, indication that we're um, facing a challenge to the liberal democratic order is um, the growing uh, great power competition. Um, and I think the reason why this matters is because um, the United States is, you know, historically like a beacon of, of democracy and a guarantor of the liberal democratic order. And so um, the rise of China and the rise of you know, and, and Russia, the challenge posed by Russia, it's not just, um, I think, they're not just challenging the United States uh, in terms of um, pure power politics, but they're also challenging, they're also ideological challengers. Um, and so I think that is um, an important issue. Um, I think just one, one example, um, or one um, recent example for that, that it gives us another indication of the challenge to the international order is if we look at, um, if we look at the reaction by Western states to, uh, uh, to the Russia-Ukraine crisis, I think initially there was a lot of kind of lip service um, uh, siding with the West um, in condemning uh, Russia. But if we look now, and I think the Economist Intelligence Unit has done a, a, a study, they found that uh, just over 50 countries are siding with the West, 12 countries are openly supporting Russia, um, but about 120 or so um, are, cannot really be placed clearly in one side or the other. Um, and so I think that that is uh, an indication. I think um, thinking about the reason, so, so I think the reasons for um, why we've, we're seeing these challenges to the liberal democratic order. Um, I think there are at least, uh, there are obviously many reasons, but maybe, maybe four that I would point out. The first is, I think, really the, the weakening of the United States, and I absolutely agree that the United States remains, and, and you know, hopefully it will remain, remain for a long time, the, uh, a dominant military and economic power, but still um, we've seen uh, growing challenges, and um, I think we're, we're certainly seeing the end of the unipolar moment uh, of the 1990s. Um, and I think the reasons for the decline of the United States can be found also in a variety of events, 9-11, uh, the post-9-11 wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the financial crisis of 2008, um, and so forth. So weakening of the United States, I think, is the first factor um, that has um, contributed to the decline of the liberal democratic order. A second one, I think, is um, the growing importance of the global south, um, which I think is not necessarily bad news. Um, I think the South has, um, uh, it has accumulated in recent years, the global South, 
um, what we used to maybe call before the non-aligned movement or way, way back, you know, the, the third world. Um, but the global south, I think, um, is, uh, you know, is definitely um, increasing um, its stature in the world. Um, it has important raw materials like uh, uh, copper and uh, uh, lithium, which are very important for the uh, uh, technology. Uh, it has a lot of political power, um, and um, uh, it has a lot of um, infrastructure needs. Um, so, it, uh, uh, so I think that the, the, the rise of the uh, South is another important. The rise of China, I think, is a third um, main cause uh, for the weakening of the liberal international order. And I think China is important because, um, in some ways, it serves as a, as a model of sorts um, to non-democratic countries of how a country can very, very quickly, literally maybe within a generation, you know, become a leading economic power. And so it doesn't have to go through the democracy, the, through the democratic path. Right, and so I think that can serve as a as a model to some other uh, um, uh, countries, and and also I think China um, is important because it um, uh, it just offers another option to the global South in terms of you know um, uh, building up their infrastructure. They don't have to go through Europe uh, uh, anymore; they can do it through through China. And then finally, I would say that um, I think there's been a um, a failure. Uh, not a failure, but uh, um, um, a backlash to globalization, right? Globalization, I think, was, was mainly an, an, an economic issue. Um, but I think that, um, again, a variety of, uh, uh, of, of, of events have contributed to um, uh, the backlash on, on globalization, the financial um, crisis of 2008, which um, um, uh, weakened or deregulated, um, weakened the deregulated capital uh, markets. Uh, and then I think the COVID uh, pandemic and also I think the Russia Ukraine crisis have kind of sent a signal that the global interconnectedness is really problematic um, right because uh, a problem that affects one country will immediately affect other countries uh, uh, as well um, so so just as a, a as a final point um, I think that um, if we look at the kind of uh, uh, narratives right now I think you know uh, free trade I think we've also seen a weakening for example of the IMF and the World Bank and I think that we're going back almost to, uh, uh, you know, protectionism and, and uh, strengthening nation states. And so that is another uh, important issue. Okay, so thank you. Uh, it takes me to uh, the question to you, uh, Jonathan. Um, so the, the mantra of the Western discourse on, on, on uh, international politics was uh, a liberal and rule-based world order. Uh, grounded in market economics and democracy and uh, multilateral diplomacy. Do you think faith in this vision is just uh, diminished based on uh, what Asaf just said? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, I will address the question, but I'll, I'll say a few things before uh, coming to the question. Now, had you invited me two years ago to, to this panel, I would have talked about the... Um, liberal world order, democracy itself being challenged by geopolitical trends, uh, but also internal developments. The, uh, the way we work is changing, the way we get our information as individuals is changing. This is undermining every institution in our societies that matter, the free press, uh, religion, leading obviously to uh, major challenges, not only for the international system, but also for democracy itself. You didn't invite me two years ago. You invited me now. That's too bad. And the situation has gotten worse. Uh, I'm not going to talk about challenges. I'm not going to talk about crisis. We are, ladies and gentlemen, under attack. And the attack is not virtual. It's not intellectual. There's a war in Europe, the magnitude of which our continent has not seen since 1945. But more important than the magnitude of the military operation is that our neighbor, a major global nuclear power, a United Nations Security Council permanent member, is not just attacking one of its neighbors. It's attacking every core principle upon which we've built international order, every core principle of international um, relations, every core principle of European security. So whether we want it or not, and by the way, they do it without shame without hiding the fact. The masks fell. There was war in Ukraine before February 24th of last year. Uh, it was a low-level, uh, simmering conflict, unless you were the one that was getting killed at the moment, in which case it was a pretty big deal. But the masks were still on. 
you could still pretend at events like this or on TV, in governments, that this is a regional matter, maybe even a local matter, maybe it's a, an isolated problem. Well, then the masks fell. The Russians have made it perfectly clear that what they want is all of Ukraine, what they want is a fundamental altering of European security architecture. And they've all unleashed a conflict with, uh, uh, with a magnitude that we have not seen since 1945. So whether we want it or not, at the end of this, the way this war ends, and all wars end, this too shall end, the way this war will end, will uh, establish new de facto norms of international behavior. It will either become the norm that aggression as a tool of statecraft, again, is um, uh, usable, it pays off, um, or not. It will either become the norm that a larger state can, under certain circumstances, change its smaller neighbor's core foreign and security policy choices with the use of weapons or not. It will either become the norm that a larger state can change its smaller neighbor's borders with force or not. I can continue with this list. I printed out a few uh, weeks ago, again, the Helsinki Final Act of 1975, the most basic of documents that governed uh, European security, signed by the Soviets. The Russians are in violation of not some, but all of the commitments made, and not in peripheral ways, but in the, in the very you know, uh, basic um, uh, core uh, uh, ways. So this war will change everything making the outcome for us existential. We cannot allow it to become the norm that a uh, larger nation can do what Russia is doing right now. We can't allow it to become the norm. As Estonia, as a small state that lives on the periphery of Europe, or as an international community. If we lose this notion that we are united by a certain set of principles and ideas we as the international community, as those that uphold the rules-based international community, if we allow it to be proven that these words in, under certain circumstances are hollow, then we will uh, lose the only thing that unites us. It, we're defined on the international stage to a certain extent by the things that we say, but more so by the things that we do, but even more so by the results that we manage to get. The results matter. Doesn't matter how well we behave right now, how much we provide the Ukrainians with military assistance, how well we've maintained Western unity, how good our statements are, the sanctions are pretty tough. None of this will matter. The only thing that matters is the outcome. The outcome. And now, finally, on a more positive note, to answer your question. I think and you did. Picking, up, picking up from what Asaf <laughs> said, uh, we're democracies. Where um, uh, the unipolar moment is over, there's, a, there's many of us. So it's obviously messy and chaotic the way we come to a consensus uh, domestically, but also internationally. We come across as confused and confusing. We are confusing. But time and again, we've proven that you can push us only so far. So ladies and gentlemen, let me assure you, we are neither down and certainly not out. You think the sanctions are bad? You think our military support for Ukraine is significant? You haven't seen anything yet. You haven't seen anything yet. We're pushing back, and we shall prevail. Thank you. We'll uh, pick it up. Uh, Antonia. Um, just connecting to everything that has been said so far, um, the geopolitical increasing uh, competition actually open like a maneuvering space for, as you just said, the Global South uh, actors, for stronger states to be involved in the game, as uh, Turkey and Iran and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and maybe Egypt. How did that influence um, the crisis of the democratic world order? Well, first, I would like to, to thank you for coordinating this uh, panel and for Amos Gilad uh, for inviting me in this uh, very interesting uh, conference. I haven't been here since the pandemic, so it's my third time I'm participating, and I'm so honored and thankful. Well, what I would like to say before answering to the core part of your question is that uh, democracy is an evolutionary process. 
So uh, democracy is not in crisis in terms of democratic uh, principles. For example, uh, the rule of law, a, a freedom of election or being elected, the freedom of religion and other human rights. What is in crisis, and I come to that uh, part of your question, is the democratic institutions and the leadership teams in certain countries uh, that are supposed to express uh, these uh, democratic uh, principles. Well, um, according to uh, Freedom House, democracy has been under attack, um, has faced its most serious uh, crisis uh, for decades, back in 2017, when these democratic principles have been under attack by certain leaders throughout the world. And I would say that a renewed attack on democracy has been fueled by the pandemic since 2020 because autocracies responded to the pandemic in ways that serve their narrow political interests by silencing critics at the expense of the protection of public health and fundamental freedoms. And this practice has led to a diminish of the freedom of expression, which is a major pillar of accountability for the protection of fundamental freedoms and, of course, public health. Well, I tend to agree with whatever has been mentioned by my co-panelists. Uh, I, I agree with the four reasons that led to a setback in democracy, as, uh, as Asaf, Professor Asaf mentioned. But I'll add uh, ex two extra uh, reasons that I do believe they uh, led to a setback in democracy. And that is the rise of populists and the malign influence of autocracies. So we have uh, seen that populists primarily appeal to the anti-immigrant uh, sentiment and pay little if no attention to civilian and political liberties. And of course, uh, the authoritarian rules um, um, a, a, a grip on uh, political power at the, expense, at the expense of competence has uh, shown the limits of the auto, auto, autocratic authoritarian models. So democracies should unite uh, forces, as uh, has been uh, mentioned uh, previously, in order to counter uh, the uh, diminish of uh, the undermining of democratic institutions. So um, since the pandemic, we've seen that autocracies, they have paid uh, attention not only to uh, suppressing their publics internally, for example, by politicizing courts, state control over social media, zero tolerance on dissent, but they have uh, also uh, upgraded, uplifted their malign influence on other countries to undermine democratic institutions. For example, Russian malign influence and election interference in the United States of America has prompted the Department of Treasury to impose a number of sanctions on entities and individuals that have uh, employed this kind of practice. And uh, last but not least, what I would say is that undemocratic rule, as uh, expressed by certain authoritarian countries that you mentioned in your statement, um, they can endanger um, uh, economy, the economic stability and development, and political sustainability. As more countries become um, undemocratic, traitors crumble, and entire populations uh, become uh, turbulent. Therefore, I would reiterate that the democracies should unite forces and to demonstrate uh, solidarity and vigor. Thank you. So uh, it leads me to my next uh, question to you, Jonathan, um, about the uh, statement that was passed in the parliament, the Estonian parliament, a few days ago, supporting the joining of Ukraine to NATO. How would that affect uh, global world, democratic world order? Well, first, it's um, important to give you a little bit of context. Um, Ukraine needs our help. They're fighting a war for survival um, that eventually will determine what kind of a Ukraine we'll have, what kind of a Europe we will have, what kind of basic norms and principles uh, we will have. And when people discuss the help that U Ukraine needs, they often focus on the material aspects. And that's obvious that Ukraine requires military assistance, which Estonia is providing, and a number of other countries are providing. Ukraine requires financial assistance, humanitarian assistance, assistance you can go down the list. But there's another resource that people, for who knows what reason, oftentimes leave out that is as important in politics and international politics as a part of politics, and that's hope. Hope. What the Russian armed forces are attempting to do in Ukraine today is not necessarily linked to key terrain, or control over key terrain that the Twitter experts are often focusing on. They're attempting to destroy hope 
that a better future is possible, a European, a Euro-Atlantic, a democratic future that the Ukrainian people chose. That is why they are keeping a meat grinder going on, conducting a war of attrition, but that's why they are also destroying Ukrainian civilian infrastructure far from the front lines. Hope is a resource in politics and in international politics. We are, as the European Union, as NATO, we are a uh, strategic player. We want to be a strategic player. So in that strategic game, we, are, um, we need to um, focus on providing hope. Uh, no one is naive. Nobody believes that Ukraine is able to join the European Union and NATO tomorrow or by next week. We get it. We've also articulated clearly, both as NATO and as the European Union, that we see Ukraine's future, for as long as Ukraine so desires, and the Ukrainians do desire, we see Ukraine's future in those institutions. Okay, that's been established. The door is open, is what we've been telling the world for decades now. Good. What we need to demonstrate is that the pathway through the doorway is realistically attainable that they're not sitting in the same place but making progress. Everybody understands it's difficult. We understand how difficult it is. We had to join these institutions. We weren't part of the founding members because we had visitors for 50 years, as you, as you know. Um, it's not easy. It doesn't have to be easy. But you have to believe that it's doable. So we're uh, working hard as Estonia within those um, institutions to um, help Ukraine progress on that road. Um, and we believe that the NATO Vilnius summit that is coming up in uh, early July is going to be crucially important. EU decisions made uh, during 2023 uh, on whether we are able to open accessory negotiations are incredibly important because, again, nobody is naive. Nobody only listens to the speeches that we make. They look at the decisions that we're able to make. And everybody also understands that there are 31 allies in NATO, 27 member states in the European Union. We need a consensus. It's not an easy process. The other thing the um, parliament did, or the parliament's um, um, uh, statement, Estonian parliament statement, uh, demonstrates that I think is very important for people to realize, oftentimes overlooked, is that n it's not just the big allies that have domestic politics. You know, we, we, we oftentimes discuss American domestic politics for good reason, and, and big allies domestic politics. We have domestic politics as well. There are 101 members in our parliament, 95 of them, uh, proposed a draft um, statement on a very strongly worded draft statement on why we think that Ukraine's future is in NATO and why we need to make those decisions. It was unanimously adopted. Now, Estonian politics, you are not experts on Estonian politics. I do not blame you for that. But I can assure you, it is as heated and emotional and competitive as American politics or Israeli politics. There's almost nothing else that our parliament can agree on unanimously. They agreed on this. So when our prime minister goes to international meetings, it is important for people to understand that she has a domestic audience as well. And so do the Ukrainians, and so do the Latvians, and the Poles, and the Germans. We all have domestic audiences. So when it comes to the unipolar moment being over and us needing to manage and, and unite these democracies, we need to recognize the challenge of this. It's going to be, it, it's hard work. It, it's it's a mandatory, we have to do it, because it's no longer dominated by one big guy and, and then others following. We need to figure out the consensus line. It's difficult. But I think we as the European Union, with now 10 rounds of sanctions adopted and 11th uh, soon to be adopted, we've proven that it can be done. It can be done, because at the end of the day, there are more things that unite us than uh, things that separate us. So eventually, it's a matter of, um, of um, smart diplomacy that needs to bring us together. Thank you. So it leads me to the next question and uh, connects to your opening remarks. What, how would you relate to the argument that the US uh, appetite uh, for global leadership uh, waned partly because of domestic politics? I mean, there is such an argument. And based on your comment, you know, about the next sure. administration and the war. No, it's 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 a good question, and obviously it's it's one that's that's being asked, and and it's why I opened my remarks the way that I did, uh, because uh, well, it's worthwhile to have a question, uh, and well, it's important to discuss it uh, academically, and I think we can acknowledge that at least on the economic front, that there are uh, some levels of degradation of the ultimate dominance in unipolar, where there is nobody else to go to. 
But I want to reiterate my point. Uh, the U.S. economy still is the strongest in the world. Obviously, domestic politics are affecting it right now. I do believe there'll be uh, a compromise uh, reached between the President and the, and the Speaker of the House uh, to avoid the catastrophic uh, failure on the debt ceiling. But the economic desires to be supported by the rest of the world still remain, and people still come to Washington. The IMF is still based in Washington. The World Bank is still based in the United States. So I want to just make sure that the people listening today, whether here presently uh, or online, understand that, well, there may be some level of degradation. Uh, it is uh, minor, and the leadership of the United States is still there. Now, to your question, people ask often here in the Middle East, every time I come uh, to Israel or, or, or Amman or other parts of the Middle East, uh, why does the United States continue to talk about a pivot to Asia? The answer is precisely because of the conversation that we're having here today. Because the economy of China is growing. And while I personally feel that their steps towards uh, military increase and military dominance, if you want to keep using that word, uh, is much slower than anyone uh, in China would want uh, and that others uh, perceive uh, around the world. But economically, the Chinese uh, continue to advance. Uh, we acknowledge that, uh, and that is why we will continue as the United States of America to push our strength economically as well as helping our friends and allies and working together with our friends and allies around the world. I just want to address, if I may, for a moment, uh, a phrase that Asaf used earlier. Uh, he mentioned the non-aligned nations. And of course, those of us that are, are students of history, everyone here in the room remembers the non-aligned nations uh, during the Cold War between uh, the United States uh, and the Soviet Union supported nations and those that wanted to stay in the middle. And respectfully, I would say that as we look at the history, the leaders today that want to remain non-aligned don't have either the domestic political support nor the charisma of a Nehru, of a Tito, or of a Gama Abdel Nasser. And so what we see now are people trying to play a game where they one week go speak with President Xi, and the next week they want to speak with President Biden. But if we're going to talk uh, here in Israel, we'll, we'll use your phrase, if we're going to talk tachlis, at the end of the day, those countries want to be aligned with the United States. They want to receive the economic support from the United States. And it's only, uh, in my personal opinion, not that of the United States government, in some ways an attempt to create jealousy or a way that they will pull the United States back in to support them by going to speak with the Chinese, not because their ultimate goal is to align themselves fully with the Chinese. Thank you. We have a uh, short time left, and I want to uh, uh, make sure that we uh, cover most of my questions. Um, so it's not a secret, Tachles, that Israel is going through a major constitutional crisis, and... Uh, I want to ask you, Asaf, how important it is for Israel to remain democracy for the stability of the Middle East as part of democratic world order? So <clears throat> let me maybe um, start by, by just giving a shout out uh, to Israeli democracy because, you know, we've been here uh, 75 years, um, very strong and vibrant uh, democracy without um, any really major uh, hiccups. I think that, you know, a lot of democracies that we do know um, have had at some point in their lifetimes, um, some some breakdowns, but but here we've had 75 years of of, of, of conti conti continuous uh, uh, democracy, um, you know, while being in a, in a pretty challenging uh, neighborhood, um, and so um, and that I think is, is is great, and I think that everybody who's been watching, you know, the last few months um, could have been was has been very encouraged by the we've had 20 weeks of uh, uh, protests, um, you know, with massive numbers of people. Um, um, in the street, and so so that I think is something that is very uh, uh, important. Um, now, um, I, I think that um, there are some, you know, even here in Israel, um, who might see some kind of a dichotomy that uh, that you know uh, demo between democracy and security. And I think we've all 
have heard the argument that you know too much democracy might harm um, security. I really, really don't s subscribe to this. Um, I think that um, you know, I think, and I think that um, there's been a lot also of academic research and and and, and policy research um, that has uh, uh, shown evidence to the contrary that actually democracies um, make countries um, safer, stronger, and and more secure. And um, and on the other hand, autocracies, you know, they are more engaged in conflicts, both um, external conflict, um, internal conflict. Um, you know, they have greater uh, they have crime rates, violence against uh, women, and so forth. So I think that um, I see democracies absolutely as, as strengthening um, security, and we should all strive towards uh, strengthening uh, democracies for that reason, among, among others. Um, with regard to Israel specifically and its role um, in the Middle East, I think that democracy is extremely important um, in securing Israel, also vis-a-vis -vis, um, other countries in the Middle East, most of whom, of course, happen not to be uh, democratic. One is, I think that Israel is, is of course, a very, very heterogeneous society, um, right? We have uh, secular Jews, we have Arabs, we have uh, uh, Orthodox, we have uh, religious um, Zionists. And I think that democracy, I think that the only way that in which this, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, community, this, this very diverse community here in Israel can, can work is, is really under liberal and democratic uh, values when people can actually respect each other. Um, so I think that um, it strengthens national cohesion, and I think that, you know, um, the stronger a national cohesion is, the stronger a country is also towards um, the external, uh, its external relations. Um, secondly, I think, and, and I think that, you know, I, I won't even try to say it better than Amos Gilad said it um, in, his, in his opening speech, but I think the most important um, alliance that Israel has, um, the most important element of its security is its alliance with the United States. And this alliance, as Amos Gilad has said, is, is based not only on shared interests, but more importantly, I think, even on, on shared values. Um, and it is a code word. Um, I think shared values is a code word for, for democracy. And so I think that um, you know, by um, uh, and, and any any kind of weakening of Israel democracies will undermine also the uh, the U.S.-Israel alliance. And so that is an, an important enough reason to strive towards democracy. And, and and third, also I think, and this was I think also mentioned by uh, by Amos Gilad, is that we see already um, uh, some of the effects. Um, you know. Um, the so-called uh, uh, judicial reforms, you know, um, uh, even even just the discussion of the judicial reforms has already led to a lot of brain drain um, and uh, you know exit uh, financial uh, movement uh, out of the country, and so so this is of course something that will also harm Israel's security in the long term. Thank you. Uh, last question, unfortunately, because I have many left. Only last one. What can be done to uh, keep the democratic world order to ensure it, uh, based on your successful country as Greece, that is uh, ranking very high in, uh, in Freedom House uh, Index, as I just saw? Yes, that's, uh, that's uh, true. Uh, well, uh, Greece uh, ranks uh, very high in the Democracy Index. In fact, under the government of Kyriakos Mitsotakis, uh, the current prime minister, where there's been a landslide a victory in the general elections on Sunday that were held, uh, were carried out uh, on Sunday. Uh, well, Greece ranked, ranked uh, 25th uh, out of 167 countries, climbing nine places in the democracy index of uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit. Well, Greece uh, ha has uh, some very solid foundations, uh, especially uh, when it comes to uh, parliamentary and other democratic institutions. Uh, well, it supports uh, civil uh, liberties and, uh, of course, a, a system of check and balances, I would say, along with the separation of powers, uphold democracy, tenacity and dignity and the rule of law. Uh, and it is in this context that uh, Greek parliamentarians, back in uh, February and April of this year, they banned um, these parliamentarians, they voted uh, a legislation that banned a neo-Nazi political party and its leader who has been convinced on criminal charges and he's imprisoned from running in the uh, May uh, national general elections. On a separate, however, I would say uh, process, independent process, the Greek Supreme Court as well banned that uh, same political party from the May elections in line with the spirit of the Greek constitution. What does the Greek constitution says? It says that any member of political party or political parties are banned from competing when they have criminal charges. It is, in fact, the first uh, time that a political party has been banned since 1974 when democracy was restored in Greece, showing in practice uh, the Greek judiciaries and the parliament's drive to protect democracy in the birthplace of, demo of democracy. 
And a final note on where do we head, and especially in the region and uh, Israel that uh, was uh, mentioned uh, by Asaf, Professor Asaf uh, previously. Well, um, Israel is a, a multi-party democracy that upholds uh, political rights and civil liberties. Uh, I mean, protests were mentioned before, and this is a very important and a very healthy uh, you know, uh, discourse in a genuine democracy. So I have to say that Israel also ranks in the democracy index uh, in position 29th, uh, above uh, Poland and Hungary. And uh, a strong and democratic Israel uh, has been the hallmark of its relations with regional countries, with European countries, and the United States of America. Uh, therefore, uh, I would say that uh, a strong Israel uh, is, um, can serve as an example for other countries uh, to emulate, and it will definitely lead to its uplifting at the regional international levels. Thank you very much. But could I add one point? Sure. I, I just wanted to add that uh, when you compare democracies, uh, obviously complements to Greece on their re recent uh, election. The state of Israel knows this from demonstrations and the population speaking. But removing democratic institutions uh, and the backslide of democracy in, in Israel will certainly degrade that shared values that we have uh, from the United States, between the United States and, and Israel. Uh, and I think that it's been made quite clear by President Biden and the current administration that his entire raison d'etre in his first election, defeating President Trump, was to bring democracy strength to the United States because of some internal issues that we're having with our own democracy. And there is no way for him to have that as his primary goal and still support allies that are degrading their own democracy. And I think that we're seeing that play out now. The relationship between the United States and Israel will always be strong, but it's also going to be based on the foundation of democracy and shared values. Thank you very much for this comment, and thank you very much, participant, for this panel. Thank you.